Right. So, thank you all for joining me today. My name is Jaden. I'm with Canonical, um, but I've been working in OpenStack for a few years now before I joined Canonical. Uh, and I must say, it's an honor to stand before an audience with such excellent taste. So thank you for being here with me today to talk about OpenStack and deploying OpenStack. So, I think it's great you want to set up OpenStack and then you want to look at deploying OpenStack differently. That's amazing. But if you're like me, when I started my OpenStack journey some years ago, where do you start? How do you begin with deploying OpenStack? There's a lot of different ways you can do this, and this is just a list of the open source options. You've got all of these different great projects, um, every different kind of software. I mean, you know, we've got 10, 10 listed there, and if you're new to OpenStack, how do you start? Or even if you've been with OpenStack for a while, how do you know which one might be um, a good suit, suit for you, or what, what is the best one to use? Um, there really are a lot of great options, though. I would say all the options on that list are definitely good. They're great, they're worth checking out. The people who put them together work really hard. Um, it's a great community, and I can't say enough how good they are. Um, but they're not always the best fit for, for everyone and for every use case. Um, so I would say we're not gonna talk about which is the best one, because there isn't one best one. I would say it's, a better, um, it's better to ask which one's the best one for you, because not every use case is the same. Not every team is the same. Not every infrastructure or situation is the same. And what works really well for one team uh, won't work well for you. Um, so. Who are you? So I would say um, if you're new to OpenStack or even if you're, you're looking to change what you're doing, ask yourselves questions like these. Um, you know, what, what does your team look like? What does your skill base look like? What are you doing today right now? And how much are you willing to commit of these different kinds of items? Um, because whether you're committing, taking your, your data center infrastructure or the software or each of these different parts of the, the stack, you could say, um, that can greatly influence the type of OpenStack deployment that you will go with or the type of solution you will go with. And of course, if you see that list and you think, that is way too much for me, I can't do that. That's okay. There are um, plenty of great commercial providers you can rely on to help you with different parts of OpenStack, from getting set up, from running the whole thing for you, um, from running parts of it. Um, there's a really nice, nice commercial um, ecosystem for OpenStack right now. Um, it's really exciting to see it grow and get bigger every, every year. And that QR code there will take you to that URL you see to the OpenStack uh, Marketplace. If you haven't checked out the Marketplace, it's a place on the website, um, openstack.org, where you can see different types of providers and these different categories I've listed here and beyond that um, who can help you meet your, your individual needs. So if you are just too nervous about deploying OpenStack, definitely talk to one of these people. Check out the Marketplace. These are the people who are um, sanction, you could say, or, or they, you, can, you can trust that when you get OpenStack from them, it's what the Open, uh, the open Infrastructure Foundation considers as true OpenStack, um, and it's compliant with all of the standards and, and API requirements um, that OpenStack provides. Um, but if you're bold and brave, and you're confident that you can be up to this challenge, and it is a challenge, um, then I have some questions that I want you to ask and to consider um, for this. So first, what are you doing today with your infrastructure? So are you using Kubernetes, for example, or are you just using something, something else? Um, what distribution are you using? Are you using a, a Red Hat-based distribution? Are you using Debian or Ubuntu? Are you running on Windows? Um, do you use some kind of orchestration software to manage your deployment and to manage the configuration uh, right now? And just to be clear, it's great, you know, it's perfectly fine if you say no to these questions or you can't answer them, that's fine. Um, but the, your answers to these questions will shape the types of solutions that may be a good fit for you. Because some OpenStack solutions are better for one operating system or distribution than another. Um, or some run on Kubernetes or not. Um, so really I want you to think about what are you doing today? What are the skills that you have? What's your infrastructure like? And what can you carry forward? And what are gonna be the gaps um, in your own infrastructure when you're trying to deploy OpenStack? Um, because that will make a big, that'll be a big challenge for you. Um, especially if you pick a solution that doesn't fit what you can do today and you're not ready to grow into that solution. Um, next, I would say consider your use case. Uh, because all of these different OpenStack projects out there, um, they're made for specific use cases by specific people in specific contexts. Um, so some of the most common OpenStack workloads you see that some of these projects were made for are, are high performance computing or uh, telecommunications. Um, some of them depend heavily on container orchestration or some of them are just for plain virtual machines. Um, and I would also say to consider, too, who are the people who are going to be using your, um, 
your cloud from day to day? Is it just gonna be you and your own internal team powering stuff? Are you gonna be opening it up to external customers? Are you going to be um, using it for internal customers? What kind of workloads are you going to be, be powering with OpenStack? Um, because again, this kind of, of consideration will shape what kind of OpenStack will be a good fit for you um, and what, what will help you be more successful over the long term. So, um, Yes, and like I said, also consider are the use cases similar to yours. So like if somebody, um, somebody in, in the HPC field makes a version of OpenStack that's tailored to the HPC field, that's probably one that you want to use. Or if you're a telecommunications provider, there's ones, um, this distributions of OpenStack, you could say, that are made by telecommunications providers for telecommunications providers. And they're probably going to fit your use case better than an HPC or a general purpose um, virtual machine hosting, hosting um, platform. Um, if you are comfortable with Kubernetes, if you answer that first question, then there is a project that may be a good fit for you. It's the OpenStack Helm project. And when I say comfortable with Kubernetes, of course, I mean not just using it. I also mean administering it. Because um, I would say in my experience, you know, you can be really great at using Kubernetes, but if you've never administered your own Kubernetes cluster, you're missing out on this other area of, of knowledge and expertise um, that you would need to run OpenStack on, on Kubernetes, unless you're going to run it on somebody else's platform, like GCP or AWS or some paid provider, uh, which is fine. Um, I understand not everybody wants to master the intricacies of Kubernetes and how to administer it. Uh, but if you do feel comfortable with it, I would encourage you to check out the OpenStack Helm project. Um, that it uses, it uses Helm, Helm charts to deploy OpenStack. Um, if you're not familiar with Helm, of course, it is a um, tool for, for grouping and organizing your Kubernetes deployments in reusable, um, composable fashions. Um, so you can more conveniently deploy them and manage them. And OpenStack Helm also gives you a lot of niceties, um, scripts and tooling to deploy Kubernetes itself if you need. Um, but to also configure Kubernetes to, to meet their workload and to deploy other services that OpenStack requires like Ceph or NFS or networking, um, that the project has all of those pieces. Um, so if, you, if you're great with Kubernetes, definitely give them a look. Because um, it's a good, good project, it's been around for a long time, um, and it's a good fit for people who are comfortable um, using container orchestration and who want to um, live the bold life of running OpenStack on Kubernetes in containers and pods. It's probably not as bold as it seems, but I think it's a little, a little bit on the, on the edge out there. Um, if you use Ansible, there are some good projects that can be a fit for you and that can really, really line up with your existing practices. Um, but those are the OpenStack Ansible and Kala Ansible projects. Um, they both use Ansible to orchestrate the deployment of OpenStack services and to configure OpenStack and to uh, manage the services after they've been deployed. Um, they do use a slightly different approach. The OpenStack Ansible project uses LXE um, containers to deploy OpenStack, and the Kala Ansible project uses Docker containers to deploy OpenStack. Um, so I, I would say um, if you don't want to have to deal with Docker, which I understand it can be a little finicky, a little troublesome sometimes, um, maybe go for OpenStack Ansible. But if you're okay with Docker uh, and you wanna, you're comfortable using Docker and you like it, then um, Kala Ansible is a good fit, and those Kala uh, Docker containers are good. Um, these, I like these projects too because they are more flexible than some of the other ones. Um, they're not as strict in what you can do. Um, they do provide a lot of defaults and help to get you started, but you can do a lot more to configure them since they're not as, um, they're not as opinionated as like, you gotta run on Kubernetes, or you gotta do it this exact way, um, like some of the other projects um, tend to be. Uh, these ones also, that question about which distributions do you run on, um, these ones have wider support for different Linux distributions than some of the other projects um, that we're, we're gonna talk about. So, if you use Juju, um, then I could say Charmed OpenStack is probably a good fit. Um, Charmed OpenStack is the OpenStack deployment that uses Juju to orchestrate and manage um, the deployment of OpenStack and to uh, provide some day two operations. So things that you would do with OpenStack after. Um, it is more opinionated than the other solutions, like I said. So if you're gonna use Charmed OpenStack, you have to manage it through Juju and run it through Juju, uh, which is fine. You know, some people like that. They like having the guardrails and the, the safeties and, and having an opinionated solution so they don't have to worry about figuring out their own opinion on the solution. Um, this one also integrates well with, with Metal as a Service and other, other software um, that Canonical works on. Um, but by all means, again, if you're looking for something a little more flexible, then maybe look at one of the other projects. But if you're looking for, for guardrails and, and opinions, then this is gonna be a good fit for you um, as well. And of course, if you use none of those things, don't worry. 
there are other options. Um, there are some, some solutions that are built on tools like Chef and Puppet and Salt. They are less developed in recent years than some of the other ones. Um, so definitely take a look at how much community support they have and how much um, what their user population is so you don't, you know, you don't do a five-year deployment on a tool that's going to go away next year because nobody's using it anymore. Um, there's also other tools out there that I haven't mentioned that because we don't have time to cover more than just the um, a handful of tools. The ones I mentioned now are the ones I have mentioned are all the ones that are officially listed on the OpenStack.org site um, as well. If you want to refer to that list, um, and of course you can always pick what works for you from these different tools. Uh, like I know a previous company I worked at, they um, tried out a bunch of different solutions and they settled on Kala, Ansible. Uh, but then they took out the pieces that they liked and extended it with some custom tooling and, and really um, shaped Kala and Kala Ansible to meet their own use case. So it's still built on top of those pieces and we can still benefit and contribute to the community um, with those pieces, but we can make a solution that fit us, uh, that fit the unique needs that we had at that time uh, more closely. So, so definitely, um, if none of these solutions seem like a good fit, just find the parts that work for you and pull them out and try to figure out how you can fill the gaps and how can they help you get your workloads done and deliver value for your users. And now, some of you folks who have been working with OpenStack, you may be wondering why I haven't mentioned Triple O yet. Um, I did want to just mention a small note about Triple O that, um, so Triple O was a, a deployment tool that used OpenStack to deploy OpenStack. That's what the Triple O is, OpenStack on OpenStack. And what you had to do was you had to deploy an OpenStack cloud um, that you then used to deploy other OpenStack clouds um, using OpenStack services like Ironic for the bare metal management using um, OpenStack Heat for, for orchestration, using uh, Mistral for workflow management. Um, if you don't know the services, that's fine. That's completely fine. Um, it also had some, some, some uh, bash scripts and puppet scripts and this and that mixed in for, for fun. Um, but it was a good long tenured project. It did a lot of good work, helped a lot of people. But earlier this year, the um, developers <coughs> who are working on Triple O announced that Wallaby is going to be the last release that they, they support. Um, and as of, as of now, that's the last news I had on it. And that QR code will take you to the post if you want to see the full discussion um, about it. So um, yeah, that's why Triple O, it is good. It's a good solution. But since it's not really getting a lot of development on new releases, I can't really recommend it. Um, but maybe somebody will pick it up. And if, if they do, then definitely give it a look and see um, if it can meet your needs. Um, but again. Are you ready to, if you're ready to play OpenStack, you're ready to get started with this journey. Um, all of these different softwares, they do offer evaluation, um, they offer evaluation tools that you can use to try OpenStack, to get started easy. Um, the main official one you could say is DevStack. Uh, now I will caution you, DevStack is the uh, deployment of OpenStack that the community uses to test out OpenStack. So when they push changes to the OpenStack code, they use DevStack to make sure those changes don't break OpenStack. Um, so it, it sets up really easily. It sets up very quickly. It is very straightforward, I would say, to get to like an OpenStack login uh, for Horizon, the OpenStack dashboard, or to get to APIs. Uh, but it's not necessarily for like start here and then go to production. It's just, is OpenStack working? Here's what OpenStack looks like. Um, and if you're fine with that, then check it out. It's pretty easy to install. You can install it on a single machine. Um, definitely use it in a VM or a machine that you don't care getting wrecked because it installs a bunch of packages, makes a bunch of changes, because um, it's meant to be used in disposable um, environments. Um, but it, it is a good solution. And if you want to get the URL, I'll pause here for a second, this QR code to take you to the um, documentation for DevStack, if you want to get that. So. And DevStack's not the only, uh, the only tool. There are other tools out here. Um, in the ecosystem that have all-in-one installers or, or quick installers. Um, I know OpenStack Helm gives you a lot of stuff to install Kubernetes and, and other uh, resources that it needs. It doesn't really have an all-in-one installer that's meant for like a small uh, footprint, but it can take care of a lot of the work of getting you to running OpenStack Helm on Kubernetes um, it, with their defaults and their configuration, uh, which is nice. It saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of, of effort and having to learn how to run Kubernetes and Ceph and all of these things that you could master on their own uh, to make it work. Um, the other two projects, though, Kala Ansible and OpenStack Ansible, they do have really nice 
installers for evaluation, trials, all in one kind of, of looking at OpenStack. Um, the first one is a universe from nothing, um, which is a, a tool that builds on Kala Ansible and some extra pieces to give you an OpenStack cloud on, a, on your laptop or a single machine um, relatively quickly. I'd say probably like maybe within an hour, hour or two, depending on the, the computer you have. Um, I know people are like, that's quickly an hour or two installation, but for OpenStack, that's pretty fast, <laughs> especially if you don't have to spend you know, six months uh, <laughs> configuring it and figuring out how, how all the pieces fit together. Um, no disrespect to OpenStack. It's a complex system with a lot of parts and a lot of things you have to, to worry about to get it to work. Uh, but a universe from nothing, I, I like that one. That's really good. Um, another one, OpenStack Ansible, like I've got listed there. They have an all-in-one installer that'll do a, a VM and put everything together in a single um, unit instead of distributing it all over uh, multiple, multiple systems. Uh, here is a QR code for a universe from nothing, and there's the URL if you'd like to, to try that out. Um, and these installers are things that you should be able to do in like an afternoon or within a single work day to get to an OpenStack cloud. And then here is the um, installer for OpenStack Ansible. I like these installers too, because I feel like, especially the, the universe from nothing, they give you a good starting point to learn how they're configuring OpenStack and how OpenStack is configured in general that you can then um, grow from to create a production configuration or a production environment. Um, that more so than um, DevStack. They're meant to, to give you the seeds in the beginnings of, of your own OpenStack configuration that you can run in production. So again, there are so many great options. The community is, is big, it's growing. There's all of these different choices. Um, it's, there's no way to say which one is the best. So really try to find the one that is best for you, the one that best meets your needs and the context of your team and what you're trying to do. Because um, I think if you can do that, if you can find, if you can figure out who you are, you can find the solution that'll fit your needs and you'll have a much better um, journey with OpenStack than, than if you just try to brute force it or, or try it blindly. Um, and of course, there are plenty of, of changes and developments coming on in the deployment of OpenStack. That it's still a very active field. There's new commercial providers coming out every year with different approaches. There's new, um, new projects and changes to projects. So if you aren't entirely satisfied with this, this spread we've looked at, um, just, just wait and see what the community's got because a lot of great things are, are coming out. Um, I have a little shame, shameless plug for a project I got to work on. Um, at Canonical, we've been working on a new deployment called Sunbeam. It's a very new approach to deploying OpenStack. Uh, it's meant to be a, it's meant to be so easy that a person who knows nothing about OpenStack and very little about technology can deploy it, and that you can have a production-ready cluster in, um, you know, maybe an hour or two, and you can start learning, learning OpenStack and really getting into it. Um, we have a fun um, competition, fun game we're doing. You have tried OpenStack, give it an installation, you can get a code that you can redeem at our booth for swag. And on Thursday, we're going to have a larger workshop where we'll have people on hand to take you through the installation and talk about it and um, demonstrate it further. And if you have any questions, of course, where the people in these bright orange see from space t-shirts and polos, uh, we have a booth in the marketplace if you want to come and ask us about it and see what it's, what it's about. Um, yeah, so. It is an exciting time to be deploying OpenStack. It's definitely gotten a lot better than when I first started deploying OpenStack um, four or five years ago. And I'm sure even then it was a lot better than deploying OpenStack 10 or more years ago. Um, so it's a great time to, to try OpenStack and to get out there and really get your own cloud, cloud together. Uh, this is me. Nope, that's me. Those are my, my different contact information. If anyone has questions or wants to follow up afterwards or just wants to say hi or send me funny cat pictures. <laughs> and I think all the slides and recordings, of course, will be on the, the internet later, which I may regret that. Once all this information hits the internet. Uh, the sacrifices we make. So thank you for coming here. I appreciate you all listening to me talk about this. And we can do some questions if you have questions. Yes. You did mention Airsheet. Is that not 
Uh, so Air, so I know I had Airship and like Starling X and them on the uh, the big list of open source projects. Um, I didn't mention them because, I, as I understand, um, those projects are are uh, relatively focused on their use case. Um, so they're not necessarily like I, I wouldn't point like somebody new to OpenStack who's just looking for general purpose um, virtual machines um, to start with with something like Airship or, or Starling X, uh, just because I understand them to be more focused on other use cases than just that particular one. Uh, but if I'm wrong, I would love to to be educated and tell me I'm wrong to my face so I can learn better <laughs> and learn more. So yeah, the question, in case other folks didn't hear, is uh, how do they scale? How do these different solutions scale? Um, so it it does it depends. Um, they all have their different breaking points. I know um, some of the solutions will only scale to to a few hundred nodes because you start you start overloading the database that OpenStack's relying on, or you start overloading the network network layer. Um, that is a question that depends a lot on your, your individual architecture and that your setup, uh, how you have things set up. Um, I would say that OpenStack Ansible and Kala Ansible probably should scale uh, nicely, since they are, are simpler. I know I know you, when you add Docker Docker in, it gets it gets challenging, and some of the um, the clustering services that they they deploy don't scale nicely beyond you know 50 or 100 nodes. Um, I will say though, I have seen in my experience that there are not as many like a thousand node clusters as you might think, or ten thousand node clusters, or hundred thousand node clusters. That when somebody has a hundred thousand nodes, they've got two hundred clouds that are running, you know, two hundred nodes here, five hundred nodes there. Um, so it's not quite as big of a scale um, as you might see. But these these tools should get you to um, a relatively large footprint. Um, I'd say at least a few hundred nodes. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. So I have a question. Like uh, most of the customer, like what percentage of the customers are using which deployment? So which is which is most popular and which is the least preferred? At least if you can give me. That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I have numbers. Um, but the um, Open Infrastructure Foundation does a or the OpenStack org uh, community does a user survey. Um, that I think breaks that down um, in some kind of detail. Yeah, because um, sometimes management just asks, well, what's the popular one? Or why should I go with, with something which is least preferred? So I, I don't know what yeah. is least preferred. So once I select the deployment, and then later the, the management comes and say, you, why did you select the one which none of the customers are using? So at least which is popular makes more sense for the management to put, to put the money on. So that, that was the reason behind this question. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I I would say uh, I do know that, or I would say the Kala Ansible, Kala and Kala Ansible, and that that group of projects has a relatively wide um, user base. That it's not just one company driving driving that project. That there's a bunch of different groups um, and people who, from different um, industries who are working on that. Um, so I, I would say, in my experience at least, that's that's been the most um, diverse or or wide community out of the others. Because um, I think all of the, I think. Um, OpenStack Ansible, it has a good community, but I, I think it um, has a lar like a large company sponsoring it. And then I know Charmed OpenStack is, is Canonicals, and then Triple O was was sponsored by Red Hat um, in, a, in a large part. And um, I mean, OpenStack Helm I think is 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 good, but I think OpenStack Helm being a Kubernetes deployment um, that limits the the user base to people who know Kubernetes, um, which is a big user base, but it's not as big as everyone else. Um, so, but if, if you're worried about that, I would say Kala Ansible is probably the, the broadest um, adopted or used tool of the ones we talked about. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. What would be your recommendation for like the real life uh, situation when you have components of the first like from different releases? Which one is super dark and super dark? So, you've, so the question was what, what do you do when you have components from different releases? I would say don't. 
if you can avoid it. I, I know that's not, that's not an option. I know sometimes that you, you can't manage that. Uh, I, I know the way I've seen that problem solved before is just backporting patches and maintaining your own um, forks of the upstream for your release. Because um, I know my, my previous employer, we had some issues with Octavia um, that were fixed in a later release. And we backported the patches into the release we were using so that we could have the fixes without having to force upgrade the whole, the whole thing. Uh, but I know it's not, that's not a great solution because then you have to maintain all this extra code and patches. So I, I don't think there's a good, a good answer. Oh, the, they, well, o OpenStack, I don't think generally, um, it doesn't like it. I wouldn't say it necessarily it's supported. Um, but I, I would say, um, so, in my experience, Kala Ansible is relatively flexible in how you can, you can deploy the different um, services. Since it deploys the Docker container, uh, the services as Docker containers, you can select which um, containers you want to use. Um, so, so like I, I've used ones that were, um, some were source, built from source, some were built from binaries. Um, I've mixed and matched the deployment to try to get it to deploy um, services that there weren't images for, for uh, Docker images for, um, or that we had custom built Docker images for um, that we used instead. So I would say um, Kala Ansible is probably the most flexible one I've, I've had experience with. Um, and you could probably make that work. Um, but I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you can get out of that situation <laughs> as soon as possible. Yes? You mentioned Kubernetes. What's the best practices and use cases when Kubernetes on the stack versus the stack on Kubernetes? What is more more I know you guys have talked before a few months ago. Did you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the question is, um, what does it look like, or what's the use case kind of looking like for running Kubernetes on, or running OpenStack on Kubernetes? Um, so I would say it depends on, it depends on what you're trying to do. So like that, um, that Sunbeam deployment uh, that I mentioned, the way it works, it deploys the control plane services on Kubernetes, um, which I, I think is, is a reasonable thing to do, because you can get them to be, um, more recoverable, you can have them be more, uh, you can get the clusters together more easily, you can manage those services and maintain high availability uh, more easily than you probably could just deploying the cluster in isolation on bare metal uh, with the nodes clustered but they don't know what they're doing or they don't know their health. Um, so I, I like that approach, but I know um, some other new approaches and new tools that are for running OpenStack on Kubernetes are running the hypervisor on Kubernetes um, and that, I know that's an unsettled area, that there's a lot of development and, and cutting edge stuff going on in that, that part, um, but I, I know sometimes you have to make trade-offs to get OpenStack to work, you have to give up some of Kubernetes, either some of its security or some of its, its container orchestration or some of its isolation, or you just have to break it or reshape it, um, because OpenStack was made to run on bare metal, and so it's gonna have a certain set of expectations for how um, its environment looks, and Kubernetes, by itself may not fit that. And so I know some of the, the projects out there have, have looked at changing Kubernetes or writing new um, virtualization drivers that you can run through Kubernetes. Um, so but, so I, I would say, I think for the control plane, if you can put them in containers and run that, that's great. Do that for days. But for running the hypervisor and compute services, maybe wait a little bit and see how that, that settles down and how that technology evolves. Because um, it's still, still working and, and being developed right now. Uh, so uh, this will be the last question, and then we got to go. So. On upgrades? Yes. Uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So it, it depends. I, I will say, um, if when you put the, the services in containers, that helps the upgrading process a lot. That makes it a lot easier to do rolling upgrades, in my experience. Um, so, so like I, I've used Kala Ansible and Kala um, extensively out of all the different different projects. And the upgrade journey was, was nice. It was relatively smooth, because you just pull new Docker images and restart the, the containers with the new images. And all the configuration is mapped in from the, the host directories. Um, all the databases are still there, because they're mapped to, to volume mounts on the host. Um, so you just roll over the containers, and there you go. Now you've got a new, new release. 
um, still definitely be cautious and take care and double check and be safe so you don't ruin your cloud. Because I've done that, and that is not fun. So that was the last question. I know we're at the end of the time. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, feel free to email or send questions. Um, come find me at the Canonical booth, whichever. Uh, but thank you all.